Thank you for uh, sticking around after lunch. It's very rare to see a crowd after t-shirts have been given and food has been distributed. So uh, it's a real pleasure and I think it's a testament to what a successful day this is. We're now going to uh, kick off a panel um, of a, um, what, I, what I deem an interesting kind. So we uh, put this panel together with the intent of explaining to a lot of folks what the contributor experience is like. And we wanted to do it through a couple of lenses. So one of the things was to focus on people who have experience contributing to open source through their organizations, experienced uh, people, um, people who are new in the workforce, um, sort of, so like new talent. And we also wanted to do a panel in response to some of the comments that we've seen in earlier sessions and uh, the focus areas and the spotlight that was shined on the number of contributors in India rising and also a large fraction of these contributors being women contributors. And so we put together an all-woman panel. Uh, of course, I am the uh, open source sort of uh, moderator voice, so I guess we made an exception. But um, that's, uh, that's our panel today for you. Um, in terms of introductions, uh, the, the world has known many women to come forward and be leaders at times of crisis. Um, we know of stories globally. We know of stories from home about um, queens coming forward and taking the reins uh, at times of crisis for their kingdoms. And um, closer to home in the technology realm, a lot of the first programming languages were developed by a lady named Ada Lovelace. Um, a lot of other technologies like spread spectrum technology came from women innovators. And so um, it, it's not very common to have women at the helm of technology. And I guess, you know, with this whole wave of containerization and Kubernetes and things like that, it's all the more apparent recently. Um, and so welcome everybody uh, to today's panel. Uh, I will shut my mouth for a while now and allow our esteemed panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, Priyanka, you want to go first? Um, hey, everyone. My name is Priyanka Sagu. Um, I work at SUSE as a Kubernetes integration engineer, and um, I do a few things in upstream Kubernetes project as well. Um, currently, I am the release lead for Kubernetes 1.29 cycle, and we are planning to um, release it on December 13th after a bit of delay. Um, I'm also the technical lead for special interest group contributor experience. Um, I'm also a GitHub admin for Kubernetes and sub-project organizations. And thank you for inviting me to the panel. Yeah. Amruta? Yeah. Hey, everyone. I am Amruta. Um, I am a product engineer at InfraCloud Technologies. Um, what I usually do is write custom controllers for different Kubernetes resources and, and play around with Kubernetes in that way. Apart from that, I've been contributing to few open source projects, uh, especially in the data protection space and storage. Yeah. yeah, hi everyone. First of all, thanks a lot, Ram, for inviting me to this panel. Yeah. And I'm Faikan Sari. I'm currently a third year undergraduate student. I'm graduating in 2024. Uh, and I am a contributor to Kubernetes, apart from which I am a, I am a part of the release V1.29 of Kubernetes. I'm also a CNCF intern at Istio, and I am also one of the contributors for ETCD, and I contribute in various areas of Kubernetes, from being one of the summit staff lead for Kubernetes Contributor Summit, to also being uh, the one of the maintainers for last week in Kubernetes development publications. So yeah, there are several areas that I contribute into Kubernetes. So as you can tell, there's people from different areas of contributions and things like that. And um, what I'd love to do for the next 20 odd minutes is uh, dig into various aspects of um, you know, what the contributor experience is like, 
what it has been like for you individually, and finally end with some takeaways for the folks that are here about how to get on board as a contributor in future. Um, so Priyanka, talk to us a little bit about um, what exactly it means to be part of you know, the Kubernetes 1.29 release in the capacity that you're in. Um, so again, I, I'm the release lead for Kubernetes 129, but before I say anything else, um, nothing is possible in any release cycle without the amazing release team we have. So I have a team of 40 people, which um, in my capacity, I lead them. But um, and apart from those 40 people, we have thousands and thousands of contributors who actually work on the actual release. So great shout out to every one of them. What I do is make sure we release on time or make sure we hit all the milestones. And uh, this is my first time being in a leadership position of this kind where I'm doing both project management and people management role. So. That's what I do in my role. So, so when you say you have a team of 40, is this a team of 40 in SUSE that you manage, or is this like a Kubernetes team? When um, I say I'm a Kubernetes release lead, uh, that means the Kubernetes upstream ah. release. Uh, so 40 people, one of them is already on the stage, mm -hmm. one of them is in the audience. Uh, I think I have a few more here. So uh, 40 people are from around the globe. Um, the team is divided into me as a release lead. I have four lead shadows. Uh, one of them was supposed to be a member of this um, panel as well. Um, we, I have five role leads who in turn have shadows under them. So that's how we make this 40 people team. Okay. Yeah, and all are from different parts of uh, Kubernetes project itself. So Faika, you want to add? your perspective to this process? Yeah, definitely. So basically, uh, like, Priyanka is a release lead for the program that we are talking about. And my perspective to this is that uh, this is a program which is your go-to point if you are looking forward to become a part of Kubernetes and looking for mentorship to contribute into Kubernetes. Since Release Shadow program is in itself a program that is uh, made in order to let new contributors come in and learn the process of contributing. So like Priyanka is the lead, she also have been a shadow at some point, like I am. And that is how you climb the ladder to becoming a core part of the Kubernetes releases. And so is there something specific that you contribute to the release process? Um, yeah, so Kubernetes release, there are several areas. I contributed to the nodes areas, that okay. is creating release nodes, but that's not the only area that we focus on. Since every release has lots of responsibility from doing code, release nodes, uh, managing enhancements, and managing the communication between these different teams. So all of these areas comes up with their own responsibility, and there are mentors in all these areas and their mentees. These mentees are basically the shadows who work for the team, and the mentors guide them, also work towards a successful release. Speaking of uh, consuming the work that you do, Amrita, you consume Kubernetes releases, um, but you also have um, contributions to your name, but to other the projects, uh, could you um, explain a little bit about what areas do you work on and what contributions do you uh, do? Yeah. So um, I have been contributing to uh, projects that are related to data protection. Uh, one of them is Canister. Um, I've, I've given a few talks on that as well. So it's a backup and restore solution for Kubernetes resources. So we deal with uh, writing custom resources in Kubernetes, write controllers around it, how to to backup of these resources and restore it. So we, we started off with a team of a uh, couple of engineers which, which built it kind of uh, at the starting point. They were one of the few engineers who started contributing to that project. And then later on, it's a, it's a big project that recently turned into a CNCF sandbox project. So that is one of it. Other project that I have contributed in my early stages of when, when, I, when I was onboarded to Kubernetes was Open Policy Agent, which is in security area for Kubernetes. So we write rego policies, which is a different language, again, to write different types of security policies on the different Kubernetes resources. So I contributed there as well. I I played around it with first, that how it works and how, how I can 
try to find out issues over there and then once I kind of got a hold of what it does, I looked for some issues to start contributing to it and then I, I picked up. So in terms of contributions itself, I'm sure that there's a lot of people who <clears throat> come forward, who start, but sort of fall off suddenly. Um, uh, and. And I'm not saying there's some magic special secret sauce somewhere, or uh, it could be just personal hard work and dedication levels that you have. Uh, but could you share a little insight about what it is that helped you sustain, I mean, helped you start and sustain as a contributor? And I'll start with you, Priyanka. Um, so I also have my failure story. I started with Kubernetes, um, I think, in 2020 late. I tried, um, did not work out, and I went back to whatever I was doing that time because it was very overwhelming. Um, I think it was a time when I was working on the project with people who were contributing to Kubernetes in all different capacities like node storage, and, and I, as a consumer of Kubernetes at that point of time, could not understand how storage worked outside a Kubernetes cluster. For me, it was a black box. This is a Kubernetes cluster, and that's it. I don't know how to take out Node and work on it separately or storage. So when all these people used to talk about all these things um, in the room where I was sitting, well, it was extremely overwhelming, um, and I just gave up that time. But I realized that um, it's not just Kubernetes project, any open source project of this size. There is always a learning curve. and when you realize that is there, uh, I think that's an enlightening moment. You, you know that it's not going to work out in day one or week one or maybe month one as well. But um, spending that time is actually one of the requirements. You have to do some hard homework um, to even start reaching out to people in the project on what do you exactly want out of them. So that's what I did after six months, I think, um, what helped me to come back to the Kubernetes project was my job. I was I switched to a company which was working more closer on Kubernetes kind flavor of code. I would read those code and then I come back came back to the project. I think and I would give a shout, shout out to Dems. I went to him and I shared my interest. Okay, I have worked on this 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 thing. Do you think um, I can help you in some way? That was good, so I gave him exactly what I knew at that point of time, and he had some problems that he wanted help on, and um, I picked those things, and that's how I started. I, I can give another example. I was, um, I think one of the few things, first few things I did in Kubernetes project was contributing to the Python Kubernetes client. Um, I joined one of their meetings for the very first time. I introduced myself as somebody who is sitting there trying to learn what the group is talking about. And I'm like, OK, I can pick up some beginner issue. And they gave me one issue, which I could not understand, even though they had marked it as easy to understand or beginners. OK. Um, what I did, uh, I think, I started looking at the documentation of the project and the examples they have in their repo, um, started playing around what is working, what is not working. And I myself in that process realized there is so many other things that are not working. Maybe I can start from there. So I took like a back turn, maybe a few steps back, just did minor documentation updates, minor um, example fixes of usage of Python client, and then went back to maybe retrying what I was actually assigned in the first place. And that's how I started. So there is always a learning curve to anything we are starting new with. Uh, realizing that is a, is the first thing that I would maybe share with anyone. Just give some time. It is If it is hard or if it is looking like hard, actually, maybe, not maybe, most times that is the case that it is hard. So, um, and that is hard for everyone, not just for that one person. Uh, so just understanding the technical perspective for some people, it might be like maybe a few weeks. For some, it might be a month. You have to understand the background from where they are coming. We really can't compare ourselves with people in the same room, because somebody, maybe they are working on so many other things that right away helps them to get started with this other new project. So it really matters the background from where you are coming from, and also 
doing some homework before uh, reaching out to people because it helps you to narrow down your questions, what exactly you are looking for. Uh, one of the things I, as a uh, person who have spent some time in the Kubernetes project, I see people reach out to me with questions like, I want to start with Kubernetes project, can you help me? I really want to help them, but honestly speaking, I don't know what, I, what are they really looking for. So it ends up being my work to actually talk to them uh, and narrow down the scope of what exactly they are looking for. Or uh, sometimes it ends up me putting my opinions on them. So I really don't want to do that. Most times I want people to find out what do they really want. Because sometimes like if I am working on something, maybe they do not like it and I'm they asked, asked a blanket question and I really like pointed them to that side and that was not the thing for them. So it's okay to try to try error and fail, but um, yeah, just doing some homework helps to narrow down those questions. Um, and then you can reach out to anyone for help. Open source projects is um, the places where you will find out, definitely find out these helps in many different ways. There's a lot to unpack in that answer. I'll, I'll come back to you about some specific questions. Um, if you don't mind me interrupting, Amrita, do you want to share your first contribution story as well? Yeah. Um, so when I started off, I had at around six years of experience in different domain. So when I started off in Kubernetes, I was already, I already had a mindset. I, I already had an expertise in different domain. So to shift that uh, mindset to how Kubernetes works. So when I started off Kubernetes, okay, I have to learn cloud. Okay, then what do I have to learn more? Okay, I have to learn Docker. So so it was like starting from scratch, like I'm a like fresh out of college that I have to start on the things. So that was a difficult, uh, I would say, transition that initially, okay, I need to start learning. And there are younger people than me who know more about it. So that was a uh, different, uh, you can say fear, okay, they know more, I need to study, I need to, uh, you know, uh, be at a pace that I can uh, converse with them as well. So I initially uh, struggled, but later on when I got hold of things, when I studied things, then uh, yeah, I was a bit confident over there. Faika, your first contribution story might be somewhat different from theirs. Um, could you um, yeah. share that with us, please? Yeah, unlike Priyanka and Amrita, I started as a student. That was the most fun part of it because I was not liable to contribute to Kubernetes. I was not asked by my employers, Ki, you need to learn Kubernetes or anything. It was just a fun thing because I've already been a part of a lot of upstream community programs and initiatives like GitHub Campus Export, which are pretty exclusive. So I was a part of similar programs and that is where I knew the importance of contributing to open source and the visibility that it gets to you. So I always wanted to contribute to open source, but starting into an open source project which took years to build is super overwhelming. And for students, so it is more overwhelming and anyone can sense that. So I started particularly, uh, I had a lot of noise about Kubernetes. And so I just started with a simple SIG, which did not require a lot of technical skills. That was how I started. Now anyone, when someone comes to me and asks how to contribute to Kubernetes, that is the answer that I give. Nobody has already figured it out or anything. You will start doing things and that is how you figure out stuff. So in my case as well, I started contributing to non-technical aspects of thing, that not like localization or anything, it was simply documentations and also contributing to the meetings. When people are discussing something, put your views in it. Ask people what is happening, simply ask them out. So that is what I used to do. I used to join regular calls at Contributor Experience Comms team. And I used to take up the issues and areas that I know I can work, or at least I can ask them. Or even if I think it is a little difficult for me to figure out, I know I will figure out a way by asking them. So that is how I was a little confident in myself, ki even if I'm giving a challenge, I'll take it up. So that was the confidence I held in myself. As a woman, if you speak, uh, contributing to an area where you know there are lots of people, and generally you see women in tech is a little low, the number is a little low, so that is one thing even I was having when I was contributing to Kiets. But I had to keep my voice held high, 
so that I am heard. That was one thing I always kept in my mind, that I'm not uh, below anyone. Even though I am a beginner, everyone was a beginner at some point. So that's how I started with kids. I started contributing to the weekly meetings. I joined the Slack channel. I used to read all the chats. I used to read all the documentation. I used to read a lot. So if you want to get started with contributing, read a lot. Get a habit of reading. Read the Slack chats, read the keynotes from the meetings. So every open source project have their own weekly meetings decided. So all these weekly meetings have their own documents as well that they maintain, like weekly meeting notes. You just go through those notes, read what discussions are happening in these notes. And if you find some area which is very confusing, ask that to one of the sub-project lead or something. That's what I did. So I went into those things. I read a lot of weekly meeting notes. I read the Slack chats. I read what the GitHub README issues, like uh, Kubernetes. The best part of Kubernetes is its documentation. This is also one thing I highlighted at KubeCon talk, that uh, though Kubernetes is overwhelming, but it has the best documentation any open source project can ever have. So documentation, reading the documents on GitHub of Kubernetes 6 is very important. So just go on GitHub, uh, check Kubernetes, GitHub organization, read through the documentation. You'll yourself figure out that there is, it is very simple to contribute. But reading is important. You can't just go to someone on DM and say how to contribute. Don't do that. First, read yourself. Figure out a thing. If something is very, very specific, then you can definitely put it out to DMs. And if a question is good, you will definitely get your answer. So right. That's what so happened with me. I got my answers after I figured out things. And that's how I became a regular contributor. Wonderful. So in everybody's contributor story, um, there's a lot of work done through self-initiative. Um, is there also a mentorship or a sponsorship angle to your story? Was there somebody who really helped you along this path, either at the beginning or in the middle or throughout, etc. Would you um, like to yeah. highlight some It's of very that? lucky if you find a mentor in the very initial phase, like someone who just gives you the path. But in general, like if I say you find mentors, uh, in my case, I found, uh, found a mentor after becoming a very core part of the team. Like I contributed and that is where my mentors realized, oh, this is a person I should men uh, guide because I know this person is going, you know, very high. And that's how I found my mentor. So there was not a mentor initially, but with time I did find lots of mentors who are so ready to guide. And me. what kind of difference did that make to your contribution? Yeah, so when I have a mentor, now I am taking more structured approach to what I'm doing. Initially, things were not very clear for me. I, I was like, I was contributing to almost all the projects or all the issues that I came along with. I'm like, okay, I'll take up this, I'll take up this, I'll take up everything Hidden that I can do. Store. Yeah. <laughs> but now I'm like, no, I'll only take up the, con I'll only contribute in areas which I know I'm going to contribute to the larger aspects as well in the future. So now I pick up things which I know is going to help me and that is how mentorship nice. helps me. Um, Priyanka, I know you've expressed a lot of interest in this topic too and you alluded to some mentorship experience uh, before yeah. in your answer. Can you uh, speak to that please? Um, I, uh, well, yes, I had a lot of mentors along my journey, and I actually want to add a bit, one more step to mm -hmm. it, mentors and sponsors. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like Faika said, when you get mentors, um, they, they can help you structure, uh, provide you a structured path to what you really, or maybe they can show you path, and you can do whatever you want to do with that, kind, uh, that mentorship. Um, I had mentors, I think, very early on, I have a mentor sitting in the audience who have helped me even before um, I was part of Kubernetes project, before um, I was part of any open source project, and thank you, Mario Jason Breganza, for that. Um, what actually helped me beyond mentorship was sponsorship. So when people mentor, um, that's good. They are mentoring you, they are giving you guidelines, do this, do that, and they are also telling, giving you opportunities, but when people sponsor you, like when people vouch for you when there is a requirement, vouch for you where you can grow, I think that is also a very big requirement. And that happens a lot in uh, Kubernetes project nowadays, um, especially in India. I don't know if um, Nikita is here, but Nikita Raghunath, I'm talking about uh, one of the ex-steering person, current TOC, um, she has been a sponsor to me in many uh, stages of my journey at Kubernetes, what help, which helped me to take a lot of leadership position. So I was working, I was contributing on a lot of things like any other contributor, but she, 
actually we looked at the, that work and she vouched for me where there were opportunities to lead as well where i can pass that on so mentor as a mentor she also opened the path to, for me to pay it forward as a lead as a person who has this uh, capability or this platform where i can uh, share what i have learned so mentorship and sponsorship work like priyanka sorry much can hand you hand. Um, help us make the distinction a little more clear as to what exactly you mean by mentorship and what exactly you mean by sponsorship uh mentorship could mean one on one like i am talking to you right now and i can give you like a documentation follow this but if when when sponsorship enters that means when you are sitting with somebody else and now you know there is this opportunity opening up i can vouch for them or i can sponsor them that's where like sponsorship comes in the picture uh so if for example let's say faika is a lead somewhere and she knows she has to um, maybe take on two more people under her who could be next leads so if if she knows i have been working with her or she knows somebody who has been working with her and she wants to now sponsor them and take her role that sponsorship so mentorship is important and sponsorship is important but if if they are together both in same Got place it. i think that it works wonders got it uh, uh, amrita i'm going to take a slightly different approach in your case um in that i from your story i heard that there's a different kind of balance that you had to strike between work that you were doing and starting on open source um, mm -hmm. stuff so what was that like can you um, share that with the audience yeah so when i started off uh, contributing to open source uh, uh, i didn't know that it it, it is going to take uh, more time than the working hours but but later on after a couple of weeks i i realized that okay i'm not able to contribute to it much even though i am a lot interested because of project work then then there was a push from my side that okay i need to work over time i need to maybe if i am interested i'm passionate about it i have to contribute on the weekends as well so that is how i prepared uh, my mind that okay i have to give more hours if i want to do both of the tasks to together which one of them is of course uh, you're going to get uh, recognition and a different type of profile that you're going to build and other is of course your project work also the organization i'm that work i'm working is all supportive it's they always encourage people to contribute to open source so so there's a lot of support from them as well so yeah that is how uh, i feel nice um again i'm going to switch tracks once more uh, and now i'd love to focus on some actionable answers and insights for the audience now there might be people who are very experienced with certain projects uh, there might be people who are just starting out fresh out of college and there might be students watching this or in the audience or uh, who might have questions about how to get started becoming an open source contributor so um any word of advice about um here's a way to get started based on your experience and based on the context that you have i'll start with you priyanka um so there are projects uh, which offer structured mentorship or structured paths for onboarding i would not say kubernetes is the bestest there or <laughs> uh, but we so have thing to say on cube day india but oh, okay yeah <laughs> like i am um, i am part of contribex and that particular sig is responsible for uh, creating a improving the contributor experience and we <coughs> take feedback whenever somebody comes to us for example i think two days back only i read this comment somewhere uh, we have this onboarding course a textual base a text based onboarding course on kubernetes.io um, and somebody gave a feedback yes this was not helpful because they were looking for something specific okay. and now we know like that part is missing so what i uh, want to say is look if if there are structured onboarding process look for those those are always the best opportunities uh, if somebody is in the audience is looking to start with kubernetes yes we have a lot of mentorship opportunities um, even i actually became a technical lead as part of one of the mentorship cohorts there was a mentorship cohort for sig contribex leads um, i think there is a mentorship cohort for other projects like being reviewers for that project being maintainers for that project uh, 
we have its entire SIG, for, which is very much focused on documentation. They have different roles where they invite or they welcome a lot of people who can help them triage issues. So our SIG uh, contributes, uh, sorry, SIG documentation repositories, they have issues like 700 open issues at this time. So we need help to triage them. We need help people, uh, help from people to uh, actually add labels so that somebody who is interested can come <laughs> and see them. So those kind of uh, roles, named roles, named mentorship opportunities, if you find them, best way to get started with them. Another thing, like if you ha already have figured out this is one part of the project that you want to uh, start with, the best thing you can do is look for the documentation. There is always a documentation. Maybe it's not the best piece of documentation and you can right away start with contributing to the documentation mm -hmm. itself. For example, you are looking for something specific. I think your first contribution could be go back to the channel and tell them, oh, this piece is missing, and maybe create an issue, or maybe create a PR right away, add that information. So uh, look for documentation, uh, go through those, follow, and try to understand the process, like FICA said, uh, get involved, start involving, talk. Uh, maybe if, if I was one of the people who, uh, when I started joining these meetings, I had nothing to contribute back. Like the people were talking about all these big things that I would not, I was not able to understand. Maybe it's that's okay. Uh, still okay. If you can't contribute anything, just join, sit in those meetings, be a silent listener. That is also part of your learning process, but. Don't leave it at that. Start talking. When pe if you are if you are not okay talking, maybe we are talking about meetings like Zoom meetings or these virtual meetings. Turn off your camera. Say hello. Just introduce yourself so that people know why are you there and tell them in maybe one or two lines. This is what you are looking out. Uh, why you are sitting there? Maybe you are just sitting there to understand anything about this thing. Or th so when they actually know that this is why you are sitting in that room. And if they come across those opportunities, they will give you those opportunities. So I think um, just osmosis is also a very big thing. Being surrounding yourself with the people where you want to be in at some point, or surrounding yourself with the processes or project that you want to contribute to, I think that is also a big learning in itself. Uh, you will start, if not the exact thing that you are trying to uh, do right away, maybe you will start grasping terminologies, maybe you will start grasping processes that people follow to do a certain thing, and you will have, definitely you will have some questions to ask and ask them. So yeah, get, getting involved, uh, making use of the structured programs, if there are any documentation reading, mm -hmm. FICA. Yeah, FICA, I'm going to throw this question to you with a slightly different flavor. Any word of advice on doing non-tech contributions um, and what's a good way to get started on that because I believe open source contributions do not necessarily have to be about code only um, and so anything that you can quickly share about that area. Yeah, every contribution in open source is huge. We've seen people like Divya Mohan, who is particularly contributing to the non-technical side of things, but still leading so many aspects, and so many people know about her. So uh, talking about how to start with non-technical contributions, any of us can do, even people who are in the first year of their college can start with it. So if you want to begin with it, it's very simple, I guess. You just join a Slack chat and uh, contributor experience is, is particularly a channel in Kubernetes, and several other projects have similar channels where you can contribute into. Documentation is one of the way to contribute non-technically. Plus, there are also programs like Kubernetes Contributor Summit, or be it community initiatives. These are the programs and ways in which you can contribute to the non code expects to things. And in release team, particularly we have is enhancements, communications, and release notes, which are a little non-technical aspects of things. They do involve a little bit tech, but it's not very technical. So any folk can just come and contribute. Cool. Amrita, your take on advice for people who want to get started. Yeah. So there are different programs as well, uh, which is uh, one, one of them is Outreachy, if, if you know about it. Uh, it is more specifically for underrepresented people. So if someone can go and uh, ask for a mentorship over there, people can just uh, they they uh, they look out for your story and how passionate you are and you can start contributing to open source over there and also it's paid so that's also a good thing uh, over there 
um, apart from that, of course, uh, you have to first figure out what area or expertise yeah. do you want to get into um, in any open source project. Okay, I want to target this area. I have interest in this area. Look out for projects in that area for open source. Start with small issues uh, or just playing around with that project, and then, then you can get started. Awesome. I'm going to end uh, right now with a bunch of uh, different people that I want to thank. So first of all, thank you, Divya Mohan. Hopefully you watch this recording. She helped put this panel together and identify these wonderful speakers. Um, thank you, Nikita and Dims. It's impossible to have a conversation about contributors and contributor experience without having your names come up. So if you do watch this, you know we're all rooting for you. Thanks for all the awesome work that you've done. Uh, big thanks to the CNCF and the Linux Foundation for their focus on diversity and inclusion. A lot of this is possible, uh, you know, especially the focus on underrepresented groups and things like that. It's phenomenal the amount of work that they're doing and the amount of focus that they do. I work with them personally on a lot of different events and things, and I know the kind of focus that they bring into all this. Uh, thank you all for taking the time. Uh, to, to come here and share all of these insights. And thank you all for listening to us. I hope you have a great day. Thank you.